Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message, and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer, feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone, 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. We get the Word of God tonight. Praise the Lord. And, uh, you know, I, I'm excited by the fact that uh, God is speaking to us and lives are being changed, souls are being saved, people recommitting their lives to Christ, people coming, stepping out to receive the truth, and, uh, and learning that the truth will set a person free. To God be the glory. And we're going to continue tonight, we're going to continue tonight where Jesus left off this morning, from John chapter 8 when he was dealing with true freedom. And God, uh, God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is going to get real serious tonight with us, just as he got real serious with the Pharisees and the Jewish people. And Jesus called a spade a spade. He called what was true, true. Jesus looked into the heart of his audience. And guess what I believe here tonight, that Jesus Christ is looking into our heart here tonight. Yes, there's not as many as there normally is on a Sunday night. But that doesn't mean, well, Jesus takes the night off and that we should take the night off. Jesus is wanting to speak to us. He's wanting us to learn and to grow and to blossom in our faith. But I can tell you, Jesus is not going to, uh, Jesus is not going to overlook any, not only negativity, but lack of faith or anyone that's trying to fool him. Jesus is looking into the sincerity of our heart. And Jesus wants to set a person free here tonight that maybe is struggling with having a sincere heart. A sincere heart to worship Him. A sincere heart to love thy neighbor as thyself. A sincere heart to look at their enemy and say, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to love you because that's what Jesus said to do. The, the, the Apostle Paul said that we are to overcome evil with good. And church, the, if you don't get nothing else but this statement from tonight's message, you cannot trick Jesus. The Pharisees, they thought they held all the cards. They thought that they could out, um, outmaneuver the creator of the world. And as we look at John chapter 8, we're going to find tonight that Jesus, will eat, he'll, he'll, look, he'll look for a discussion. If you want to wrestle with him, he'll wrestle with you a little bit. But Jesus wins, and then he's going to hit you with the truth. And we're going to find out tonight that with the Jews and the Pharisees, they had all their eggs in one basket, the Abraham basket. And you know what Jesus is going to tell them? Before Abraham was I am. What is he saying? He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the great I am. Amen. He is the one before Abraham, before Moses, before any of the other patriarchs, Noah, or even Adam, was Jesus Christ. So if you believe that you can outmaneuver, or anyone believes that they think they can outmaneuver the Lord, I just got news for you. You're going to lose. Right. If you want to be set free, if you want to have sincerity of faith, you will know the one. You will know and live and surrender to the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Too many times, so many people want to stay on both sides of the fence. And we just sang that just a closer walk with thee and and, and trying to stand in a gap. And that song's very dear to me because that was my grandmother's second favorite hymn next to End of the Garden. My, my grandmother who lived with us, my maternal, grand, my maternal grandmother, she loved that song, Just a Closer Walk. In verse 2, I just began thinking about her, Lord, who cares? Talking about who, who have you put in my life that cares about me if I fall for a trap or a snare? And I realize that God's put me in the life of many people. God has put you in the life of many people. The question is, do you care? 
And if you care, if you love someone and you care about them, you're going to be willing to share with them the truth. Well, what is the truth? Jesus Christ is the truth. We learned that this morning. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. Church, we have great news. We have the good news of Jesus Christ. But we can't keep playing games with him. Jesus, we either got to be all in or just all out. We can't have one foot in and one foot out. And, and, and here tonight, this message, you know, is more for folks that want a closer walk with thee. This message tonight is for folks that want to be his disciple, as we talked about this morning. Truly, not just in name only, but in deed. You want to be a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And that's what this is about. And so to do that, we first have to understand the character and nature of Jesus Christ. And you know what? He defines that for us, especially in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have that character. We have that nature. You don't have to, you know, get a counseling session or go spend hours online. You can open up God's Word and that character be defined for you, especially in the Gospels. If you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Again tonight, this is several verses tonight. John chapter 8, where we're going to pick right up with verse 37 and read down through the end to verse 59. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. John chapter 8, beginning with verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you were not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear, because you are not of God. Then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory, there is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. And you, greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead, who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and had you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I'd say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you for your patience for standing for that length of time. But I think it's important to stand out of reverence for the word of God. As it's being read corporately before the body. Church, Jesus Christ 
was looking truthfully into the eyes of a group of so-called believers and religious people, and he looked into their eyes and saw the fact that they were not servants of God, but instead servants of the devil. If you look at the gospel, you will find that you can only serve two people, either God or the adversary. There is no in-between. You're either working for God or you're working against him. Jesus declares, matter of fact, if you're not working for my father, you are the enemy of my father. Wow, I don't want to be an enemy of God. I like that. I like it when we sing, I'm a friend of God. I like it when we sing that. We don't get up and say, I'm an enemy of God. You know, that's not it. But that's your two choices. Either you're in or you're out. And that's what Jesus was trying to say here at the beginning of his Galilean ministry. As he's having this conversation, actually this is the middle part of his Galilean ministry, you know, and, and he is trying to, to bring the focus to him because he understood why he came. You may have noticed lately, I've been trying, especially since Resurrection Sunday and, and Resurrection Week and uh, Palm Sunday and then that, that whole week of Resurrection, you know, I've been trying to put the focus more and more and more on Jesus Christ. Not just the cross, but his life and his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and to, and to put more and more on the cross. Why is that? Because, church, to, if there was ever a time we need Jesus to be preached and his life and who he is as God it is today. We can have feel-good messages. We can have how to do this, how to do that, you know, even studying the Bible. But we need Jesus. We need Jesus and his word to show up and begin to change people, you know, before death wins out. You know, before folks throw in the towel, before they, they just go into the whole poor me, pity party me, and just have a major meltdown. Do you know that the adversary is around every single corner with his servants ready to sell you a pill? He's, a, he's around every single corner ready to, to sell you, you know, something that's going to damage you and harm you. Every time you turn on the television, the adversary can be there to trick you. Well, church, we need Jesus Christ now more than ever to begin to go forth and, and to manifest himself in an awesome, amazing way. And he will do that as we look at his word. He will do that. And, but hear Jesus as he's speaking to those that were supposed to be the closest to God. And he looks at them and says, hey, you're not believers of my father. You're sons of the devil. You can't get worse than that. You cannot get worse than that. I can't think of one phrase that Jesus could have said that could have been more offensive to them, if you will, than to make that statement. You say, why do you make it then? Because he's God, and these people are supposed to be representing him and his father, and they're, they're way out to lunch somewhere. We learned this morning where they told Jesus there earlier in John 8 where they'd never been in bondage, and at the time they were in bondage to Rome. They were in bondage in, in uh, Egypt for 400 years. They were in bondage to many other nations. The Babylonian captivity. They were in bondage for 70 years. You know, lying to Jesus. Let me just say this, church. Before we break down the context, be careful. Be careful that when you're talking to the Lord, that you do not lie to Him. Do not lie to God. Because God sees right through that. Say, Pastor, do people really lie to God? Oh, yeah, they lie to God. I've had people at the altar, and I'll be praying with them, and I'll ask them, Brother, do you, do you, do you have an alcohol problem? Do you know? I don't drink. And they smell it right on their breath. Right at the altar, been lying to God. You know, they're wanting God to get them out of a mess. They want God to treat the symptom. God's not interested in treating the symptom. He wants to set you free so you don't have those symptoms anymore. That's what's important here. That's what we grasp. And be careful when we lie to God and what we want. And God even knows the meditations of our heart. And God even, God even, and, and we look where Jesus even rebuked people as he looked into their heart and said, you just lied to me. I mean, Jesus, Jesus said playing games with us. And people say, well, pastor, do you, do you really think that Jesus will judge? Well, we're going to find out here in a second that where he is the one who judges. He was talking about himself when we get down to verse 50. He was talking, he's going to be the one to judge. And some people think, well, is that just talking about when you get to heaven and you have final judgment? Yes, but also Jesus brings judgment. You say, pastor, how can I not take communion unworthily next Sunday? Jesus is going to judge you. Yeah. Mock God, Jesus is going to judge you. Yeah. We, who do we... 
God has always brought forth blessing upon righteousness and judgment upon unrighteousness. Who do we think we are to think in 2014 that Jesus isn't working like that anymore? I'm seeing that firsthand all over my life and ministry to where, you know, people that come in here and we can weep and cry all we want. But if it's just for show, Amen. judgment is going to come. Amen. I know. I know. And this is very real. This is very real stuff. You know, it seems like people are dying younger all the time. But if we start mocking God... We're on very thin ice. Jonathan Edwards, in the greatest sermon I've ever heard, declared that wasn't from Jesus, where he says, be careful, your foot shall slip in due time, quoting Deuteronomy, and that message, and the fact that he, in his speaking, and his preaching, he, he looks out at the congregation as he's citing it, because basically sermons in those days were cited, but looks out there and says, every one of us, if it wasn't for the grace of God, would die. I mean, Jonathan Edwards, I mean, he spoke with great boldness. He, one of his great quotes that I love from that message is the fact that your only part to salvation is the fact that your sin, everything else is Jesus, Amen. washing you away. Amen. Washing that sin away. The only thing you contributed is the fact that you brought the sin. You brought the baggage. But church, Jesus here was getting very real in John chapter 8 with his people and his so-called uh, followers and the Pharisees and the Jewish people there. You say, why was Jesus so specific? Because they were not listening to the truth, and they were making accusations against the Lord. And sometimes we do this, well, God, how come you don't care about me? How come, where were you at in my life? How come this and how come that? We can make the same mistake as the Pharisees were making. And if you want to bring that on with God, he will invite himself into that conversation, and you will lose. And then you'll be in bondage. Jesus wants to set you free. But Jesus will set you free based on a decision whether or not you let him or not. Verse number 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me. Jesus looked right into their heart. He knew that the conspiracy had already begun back in John 4 when he turned water into wine. And, and the miracles began to take place. He knew that they were stirring, especially after Pharisees saw many of the Jews beginning to believe. He knew where their heart was. He knew they weren't interested at all in bowing down to Jesus Christ and His Word. They were interested in doing their own thing. They wanted to be in control. And Jesus says here, yes, you are the Jewish people. So He defined, yes, you are the descendants of Abraham. You know what, I'm, I'm the descendants of a great uh, assemblies of God uh, family, Pentecostal family. But I can tell you, just because I'm a descendant doesn't mean I'm going to heaven. I used to think before, when I, before I got saved, well, my dad's a deacon. My parents formed and were founding, our grandparents were founding members of my home church in 1954. A great legacy. whoop de doo That's not getting me anywhere. Yes, it's wonderful to have that heritage. I'm grateful for it. I praise God that, that, that uh, we want to carry on that heritage as much as we can through, through our family. But here Jesus sees through all that and says, Yes, I know you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. How important is the word? It's the foundation of your life. We learned that this morning. If you want to be a disciple then you have to abide in the truth of God's Word. Amen. It's very important to know and understand them. You know, sometimes we want things in our terms. It doesn't work that way, church. God wants us to look to Him. We serve, quite frankly, the book of Exodus tells us we serve a jealous God. Right. We're created in His image. He commands us to follow Him in the truth of His Word. And He says here to Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me. You know, Jesus knows who's playing, playing around with him and who is sincere. We can be deceived. We can be tricked. But Jesus can't be. Moses declares that the truth will find itself out in due time. Whether or not one is sincere or not. Verse 38, I speak what I have seen with my father. And you do what you have seen with your father. Now, if you read this, and I've heard evangelists read this. 
and where they talk, they see that your father, and they immediately think of Abraham. They don't read the context. The father Jesus is talking about here is the devil. That's why I don't like topical messages. Because it doesn't give you a context of what's going on. You've got to read the, you got to read this section of scripture to understand what Jesus is trying to say here. And Jesus was, was getting to the point of who really the Pharisees were in their heart. How many of you remember Motley Crue? I think their second album. What was that called? Son of the Devil? <coughs> shout, shout, shout to the Devil. Yeah. But there's a line in that song where it says Sons of the Devil. I remember that somewhere in there. <coughs> and I remember having a conversation with my older brother about that album. And it was an album back in, big old album, you know. Back in the mid 80s that's probably like 83, 84, yep. something like that. And I, I remember, I remember as a kid being scared by that album. And I remember and I remember listening to it. And, and, and at the end there, uh, Vince Neal, who my brother has kind of patterned his life, he looks just like him, you know, patterned his life after him. And, and, and I'm thinking to myself, sons of the devil, and shouting to the devil, and all this stuff of how dangerous that is. And church, you say, Pastor, why is it dangerous? Because if you read and understand John chapter 8, you'll know why it's dangerous. Because Jesus understood that there was a spiritual battle going on. And you could only be on two teams. Right. The Lord's right. or the devil. Remember in sports where they always chose a captain? Well, there's a captain. Either Jesus Christ is the captain. Satan's the captain. What team do you win? You can't switch jerseys. You've got to decide today. Right. You know, some people, I'll just switch jerseys. Oh, no, it don't work that way. You know, Jesus sees right through that. If you're not wearing his jersey, you're wearing the other one. He's looking for our whole life. But here, church, he's, he's, he's leading up to something here. Again, verse 38, I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They weren't understanding at this moment. Verse 39, they answered and said to him, Jesus, Abraham is our father. <laughs> Jesus says to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. What were the works of Abraham? Faith. Belief. Belief in, in what was anointed and what was true. What was the fulfillment of prophecy. Even in Abraham's day. In his early life as God spoke to his heart prophetically. You would be interested in listening to the voice of God. And that God would be ministering through Abraham and his descendants. Isaac and Jacob and, and down the line. But he says here in verse 40, But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. And Jesus again criticizes them for wanting to kill him as he was bringing the truth. Abraham wanted to hear the truth. Abraham wanted to be a representative of the truth. Abraham wanted to, to define God as best he could. Abraham wanted to be blessed of God as best he could. Abraham was not interested in seeking to kill God. And his word and the truth of his word. And Jesus says there at the end of verse 40, Abraham did not do this. Jesus, it sounds like, is getting serious with the descendants of Abraham. And he's speaking truth to them. He's, 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 he's calling a spade a spade. He's not beating around the bush. Here in Maine, Mainers like that. Mainers don't like to be spoken to indirectly. Just come out and tell me what you mean. Mm -hmm. Maryland, they like things a little bit more indirect. Mainers, just come on out and tell me. So this should not be offensive to you. You should be saying, wow, I can understand this. I'm a Mainer and, and I like things just directly given to me. Don't beat around the bush. Well, here's Jesus telling, telling them that their so-called father, who they think is their father, Jesus said, you are not doing what your father did. You are not listening to the truth. You are not listening to the voice of God from God himself, who is sin of the father. And Abraham did not do this. Verse 41, you do the deeds of your father. 
Now here, it sounds like, and I've heard this said too, well, this Jesus just contradicted himself. Oh no, you've got to understand the context. Jesus here was not talking about Abraham, and he wasn't talking about Abraham from the beginning. He was talking about the devil. You have to understand where the Lord is, is going with this, which is why it's so important to get a full context of Scripture. You know, it's so important to understand the dialogue. It's so important to understand who Jesus is talking about. Verse 41 again, you do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, the Pharisees say to Jesus, we were not born of fornication. So here they begin to insult the Lord. They begin to look at him and say, well, they weren't believing he was the Messiah, born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Spirit. Your parents weren't married and they were committing fornication. We're not listening to you. So they, they go back to his birth. They bring out some of the, the, just like anybody will do when they know they're losing an argument, they start throwing some low blows around. They start bringing up fornication. And some people still think this. Mary and Joseph was the father. They just slipped in the back and no one never saw it. Oh no, it was a virgin birth conceived of the Holy Spirit. Okay, very important that we understand that. But here the Pharisees and those, those early believers as we talked about this morning, they're wanting to bring up fornication. That there's no way that he is the Messiah. And he says, they say there, they said to him, we were not born of fornication to where they're trying to insult the Lord. They're trying to wrestle with him and kind of beat him at his own game. You're talking about the sovereign God who knows the truth of every situation. You know what? We're guilty of doing that sometimes ourselves. Well, Lord, you know, we, well, my child or my circumstances, you don't understand. And all this other stuff, you know, that we come up with. Or God, well, you, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. People say that about God. And God, Jesus Christ, was born in a manger. I have one of those at my house. They don't smell too good. <laughs> Okay? He was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. His earthly father, Joseph, died when he was about 14 years old. Jesus had to become the man of the house very young. And Jesus had three younger brothers and at least two sisters that we know of in Scripture. Jesus had a great responsibility on his soldiers. People say, well, what was Jesus doing from, we read about him in chapter, you know, Luke, and that he was 12 years old. Next thing you know, you know, he's turning water into wine. What was he doing in between? He was taking care of his family. He had a responsibility to them. That's what he was doing. And once they were all old enough to take care of themselves, and Jesus only had one responsibility at that point, that's to look after his mother because he was the oldest son. And we know that he gave even that responsibility away as he was dying on the cross. But when you look at this church, Jesus, uh, people had the gall to, to uh, try to intimidate the Lord and try to turn things around. And try to accuse him of something. Even such as the fact that he was born of fornication. Were you not born of fornication? We have one father, God. So they begin to play the holier than thou card. Jesus in the, is in the midst of a good old fashioned debate here. That's what's happening. And you know what? I think he's in the, in the, in the middle of a good old fashioned debate with many of us. That walk in this place. Every day. They come in here to serve God or to worship God or to come in for wrong reasons. Some people come in just looking for a reason to complain. To be a busybody. Some people come in just looking for a handout. They're not interested in drawing closer to God. They just want a handout. But in the midst of that, there's a war going on in their soul between the righteousness of God in the unrighteousness of the devil. Here there is a war going on in the hearts of the Pharisees and with Jesus. Verse number 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. The same one in which Abraham was serving, Jesus Christ is saying, Hey, I'm serving him too. I am the Messiah. I am the promised one. And if you truly believed in God, you would love me. Guess what? If we truly believe in God, we would love his commandments. We would be abiding in his truth. We would be, you know what, Lord? I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. Rather than wrestling with him, rather than, you know, taking what we like and throwing out what we don't like. Church, you're not going in into a grocery store, you know, buying bunches of bananas. 
I like these. I don't like those. That's not what we're doing here. We're talking about living for the Lord Amen. and the truth of His Word. And then we want to be set free. You know, think about this. Think about this. It's so important that we understand. We want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to say, yes, I serve the Lord today. I want to serve Him today. But I don't mind. I'll go hang out over there and get drunk. Or I'll go over there and, 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 and watch something that's uh, embarrassing or watch something that's derogatory. Or it's okay to tell a little white, lie, little white lie every now and then, you know, or whatever it might be. Or some people will say, well, well, I, I just, I think God's changed a little bit, you know, in 2014. No, he hasn't. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Hebrews 13. Amen. But here Jesus is starting to get real serious with the religious people. You know, from a nation's perspective, this is, how Jesus, this is how the Lord works when it comes to judgment. Before he brings great judgment, this is what he does. He first looks to the church to step up and give an account of God and his word. And then if the church does not do that, judgment will begin to come to churches. Study the nation of Israel. This is what happens. He looks first to the temple, the priest. And then when they didn't clean up their act, this is what he does. Then he goes to the kings or to the political, the government leaders. And if they don't stand up and do the right thing according to the word of God, judgment's going to come to them. But the last group of people that the Lord is going to judge, that he expects to step up if no one else will, is the people themselves. And if the people don't step up, you know, if the people don't say, you know what, I need to be in a church that's God-fearing. I need to be getting fed every week. I need to make sure that my family is growing in the word of God and that I'm worshiping God according to the truth. And then if we don't do that, guess what? As a nation, God's going to bring judgment. He's looked to the church and the church is quiet on many issues. Think about that. A lot of churches just go into complete summer mode, just shutdown mode during the summer. Why? I don't understand that. I still don't understand that. You know, we only get four seasons of the year. Well, let's just shut down the three months here because nobody's going to come out. And all that kind of thing. I've got loved ones that, that go into that mode and, and all that kind of stuff. But we've got three, we got 12 months just like everybody else in the world. We can't afford to go into shutdown mode. People are dying. People need to hear the truth. Aren't you glad that the lights are on tonight? If somebody's walking by in a point of desperation, hey, they can come in here to hear the truth. Or you could invite them to come or whatever the case may be. Even the 4th of July weekend, we could easily just close up tonight. But I'm grateful that we did. I'm grateful that you're here. And that the Lord's word wants to speak unto you. You know, but think about this. God has looked to the church and what is he finding? What is he finding? He's finding other books on the pulpit rather than his own. He's finding other formulas for help. Some churches, as I said this morning, are even bringing in yoga. It's the way it's open, even in the assemblies of God. God looks to the government. What's he find there? He finds a government that's giving money to the enemy of Israel to blow them off the map. He's finding a government that's putting millions, if not billions of dollars, into Planned Parenthood to kill babies. What does he see in the government? Where is he looking last? To the people. To the people. What's America's last hope? That Christians will rise up and be heard. If that means that they have to walk away from the status quo of the church they belong and go to a church that's going to preach the word and that's going to live out Jesus Christ, then so be it. The people, it's it. And without us, if the people don't stand up and be heard, historically speaking, then God brings judgment. You don't believe, you don't believe me? Read the book of Jeremiah. It's identified there from top to bottom. Read the book of Malachi. It's only a short book. That, Jeremiah is 52 chapters. Malachi is only a few chapters where it defines the pattern of judgment to this nation. Heaven help us if the people won't stand up. God looked to his Jewish people and he looked to these same Jesus as he's looking to these Pharisees right here, looking to them to be heard. Looking for the Jewish people there to be heard. But instead, they were, Jesus was getting an argument about who he is. Verse number 43. Why do you not understand my speech? 
Why do you not understand my speech? Why, why are you thinking I'm a liar? You know, why, why don't you understand what I'm saying? And Jesus doesn't let them answer. He gives his own answer to He will tread into their heart, I believe, and gives an answer because you are not able to listen to my word. How can someone not be able to listen to the word of God? That's because the Holy Spirit's not in there to discern the word of God to them. Right. You cannot understand the Bible unless you have the Holy Spirit. How do you get the Holy Spirit? Come to know Christ. Then the Holy Spirit is there to lead you, guide you, correct you, teach you, and rebuke you. Wow. That's so huge. It's so important to understand. Jesus could answer that question because they knew the Holy Spirit was void from their soul. They couldn't understand what he was saying because the Holy Spirit was absent. And Jesus here now, you know, he, 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 at this point, he's, he's just throwing out the arsenal. He's just hitting them where it hurts. You know, he was, if, he was, if he was on a debate team, I was on a debate team in high school, and my, my coach, uh, Mr. McComb, he would say, when you get to that point, this is what you do. He called them the go-after points. Go after them. Go after them and win this debate. Here, Jesus is going after them. He says, because you are not able to listen to my word. Verse 44, you, uh, you are of your father, the devil. Wow. Wow. Jesus said, hey, you're not of the same God that I'm from, brother. You are of the devil. Because Jesus knew there was only two choices. You are, you, you, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father. You want to do. He looked right into what their desires were. Think about that. These guys, they did not even want, have a desire to please God with their life. They were, on, they were interested in the, in the lies of the devil. They were interested in making the Lord's house a house of a den of thieves rather than a house of prayer. You know, and, and your desires, you know, and the desires of your father you want to do. Who's the father? The devil. Wow, think about this. Think about this. Jesus beat Bodley Crew by 2,000 years when it came to the power of the devil. You know, Jesus was calling a spade a spade here. And he, go, and he continues to say, he, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning. From the beginning, we know the devil who was a fallen angel named Lucifer, who came and tried to tempt and was successful in tempting Eve and Adam. And that he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. What is the truth? The word of God, Jesus Christ, his life, because there is no truth in him. Then he continues to define the adversary. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Well, people say, Pastor, I don't know if I really want to understand the devil. You better understand the devil. He's got you right where you want, where he wants you if you don't understand how he works. Right. What is the truth? The truth is the word of God. You know, it's, it's so important. Well, Pastor, we can't, you really can't bring the truth Sunday mornings because you might offend somebody. We want to bring somebody in. Church, let me tell you something. I have no care or no interest for that teaching. That can go fly a kite somewhere as far as I'm concerned. I'm worried about where somebody's going to spend eternity. I'm going before the Lord and giving an account for this pulpit. I have to go before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I brought the truth to folks. I wanted the truth to set them free. And not this other stuff worrying about offending them. Tell you what, church, I'd, I'd, I'd rather offend somebody than know that they're going to spend eternity in hell. Wow. But here Jesus gets real serious about how the characteristics of the adversary. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Verse 45, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe. Why didn't they believe? Because they were caught up in the lies. They wanted it their way. They were, they were so caught up in the misgivings of the adversary that they would not even be interested in hearing the truth. People say, Pastor, does it upset you, you know, when people don't respond to the truth of God's word? No, because I'm in good company, Jesus Christ. Amen. Upset's not the right word. It grieves my whole soul. Because I know what the answer is. They're going to die in their sin. And Jesus wasn't just talking about physically. He was talking about eternally. Upset's not the right word. Grief is the right word. It grieves me to know that people have heard the truth, but they turn away from it because they're so entrapped by the lies of the devil. The lies of the devil have so many people in bondage. Jesus said again in verse 45, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Verse 46, which of you convicts me of sin? And then Jesus throws the ball back in their court and says, hey, which one of you thinks I'm a sinner?
which one Pharisee? Almost sounds like when they were ready to throw stones at the woman called in adultery. And those jokers all had to run. Jesus was left there with the woman himself because they knew they were all far from perfect. And they could not throw a stone. But here he says, which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Why will we not listen to the truth of God's word? One's heart is hard. But basically it's because they're in love with the devil. And even their desires want to please him. Verse 47, he who is of God hears God's words. Think about that. Jesus also said in Matthew 7, the greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, obviously Jesus is the preacher of that, says that we're known by our fruits. Here Jesus is now saying, a little bit later on in his life, he who is of God hears God's words. You know, church, I believe that revival will come to this church in this river valley when people want to be hearers of God. I'm serious. When people say, you know what? I want nothing to do with the world. I want all in with God. Jesus said to be in the world, not of it. Worldly pleasures aren't going to drive me. I want to be challenged every time I step into this sanctuary. I want God to speak to my heart. I want God to fine-tune me. I want God to prune me, to make me what I ought to be according to his word. I want to draw closer to God every step of my life. But Jesus says here, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Why are they not of God? Because they're of the devil. You don't hear. And not, you know, notice here, Jesus hasn't given them the last several verses of time to speak because he's just hitting them with truth. Amen. Jesus was hoping the Pharisees would turn from their wicked way. Jesus is hoping that they would repent of their sin and he would be right there to forgive them. But they're not interested in that because they're not of God. Is every person that comes to praise assembly? I would say there are about 140 that call praise assembly home. Right now we have two shifts of people. We have a shift that come every week and that's a smaller shift. And then we have a shift that come the first and third and a shift that comes the second and fourth like clockwork. I can tell you who's going to be here next Sunday. I was teasing Erica last night when it came to the attendance book. Well, this is the first week, so they won't be here, but they'll be here next week. Sure enough, those people weren't here today. It's the first Sunday. And I will tell you, that not everybody that comes into this place, including members, are of God. I don't believe you, Pastor. How can you say that? Because the desires are pleasing the adversary. God wants us all in. They're all that. What's he saying in Revelation 3 about a lukewarm Christian? Yeah. He's going to spew you out. Yeah. Church, I want to see a revival more, more so, I, I believe, than anybody here. Because, you know, you've been laboring in the fields for 11 years. Deal with, dealing with all these things that we're dealing with. I want to see a revival, but a revival is not going to come until we say, Lord, I want just you Amen. and nothing else Hallelujah. in my life. Verse 48, then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? So they come back with another low blow. They first tell him, well, you're born of fornication. And now they say that you must be possessed. You must have a demon. You, 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 you are, a, you know, you are a, a Samaritan person and you have a demon. You know, and all this other stuff that to try to, to, to mock. And sometimes I get this. I get this sometimes too. Well, pastor, you, you, you are so young. Been here 11 years and still get that. You're or the chaplain over at Togus. I said, brother, I've been here 11 years. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. You're too young to be the pastor. You know, or, or whatever, you know, still, still get. Well, you're from Maryland. You can't understand what it's like to live in Maine. I get that. I get what you were. You were born with a silver spoon. Your dad, your dad worked in nuclear energy, so you had everything you ever wanted. People do low blows because they don't want to receive the truth. Jesus answered in verse 49 and said to them, I do not have a demon, 
but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Wow. Jesus answered the question with truth. Jesus was about honoring his Father from the moment of his childhood to the point when he went to the cross. Father, your will be done. Not mine, but yours. Jesus continues in verse 50 and says, And I do not seek my own glory. What a, what, I'd have loved to have been a fly on the wall to hear that, because that's all the Pharisees cared about was their own glory. Their own name and lights. They owned their own attention that was coming to them. Jesus rebukes the Pharisees over 30 times in the book of John. Where he says, don't be like the Pharisees just out mumbling on the corner. You know, he rebuked them over 30 different times in just the book of John. But he says here, you know, uh, you know where, he, where, where he was wanting to bring honor to his father. And he was not about or seeking his own glory. Why? Because Jesus was a man of humility. A man of humility. Some people, if they're not getting the attention, they get upset. They want everything to be about them. Well, church, they're no different than a Pharisee of 2,000 years ago. Jesus was looking right at them and speaking the truth. And then he says in verse 50, there is one who seeks and judges. Who is Jesus talking about? Himself. He is, he is speaking to them. He's speaking to them not only as the Son of God, but as their future judge. Jesus knew by this point that all authority and judgment was given to him by the Father. John chapter 5 tells us that. So, right, so Jesus knew where his judgment came and the one who seeks and judges. There is one who seeks and judges. Do you know that Jesus is going to judge you? Tell you what, some of you might need to get a Snickers bar and you better get one of those jumbo ones because you might be there a while. It doesn't have to be that way. You can, you can hear those great words, well done, good and faithful servant, well done. But he's looking into the heart, the heart of our situation. And here, those guys, they didn't even know, one, that he's God, and two, that they were going to be his future, that he was going to be their future judge. They were so caught up in their own glory and that they were defending the loyalty of Abraham, but instead they were sons of the devil. Jesus, you know, was really just, he wasn't holding anything back here. You say, well, pastor, it sounded like Jesus was even wanting them to get agitated. What he was wanting them to do was to yield to the truth. He knew their agitation was going to come. You know, Jesus, some people say, well, Jesus was so peaceful. He was so peaceful. Well, he is the prince of peace, yes. And he will give a peace that passes all understanding. But there were many times Jesus knew he was picking a fight. And during his time, he predicts over his time where there's so many times that he was going to die, but before that appointed time, he would just sneak off. He would just get away because it wasn't his time to die. We're going to find that here in just a second. Well, another one of those examples. Church, I know some of the messages that I bring are going to stir people up. But my job is to bring the truth. I pray that you'll receive it. I get stirred up through the week just preparing these messages. And I know that, that uh, with this, that lives are going to be changed and souls are going to be saved. Just like this morning, people responded to the truth. But I also know the persecution is going to come. People will pick stones. Maybe one day we'll have a window broken or angle in the window. I know that's going to take place. A tire slashed. Because the adversary is not just going to sit by and do nothing. He's going to speak to his children, the sons of the devil, to stir up strife. Jesus knew that too. But he cared about the well-being of the people to give the truth to them anyway. Verse number 51. Most assuredly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. I don't know about you, church, but in these last days I want to keep the word of God. Paul said, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Yes. Even if we're persecuted and we die, 
Paul would say from Philippians, rejoice always. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If you're going to die, you might as well go down serving the Lord. I can't think of a greater way. Blessed are those that are persecuted for his sake. Well, we shall never see death. Wow, that's awesome when you think about that. Verse 52, then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, referring to Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, as well as the minor prophets, Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Wow, they're, 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 they're starting to get fired. They're starting to look for an argument. They're starting to demean the Lord. This is the third time that they ridicule Jesus. They're the, and Jesus is wanting them to surrender to who he is, but instead they're putting up a fight. It's kind of like parents when your children come to you and they beg you once to go out for pizza. And you say no. And they come back and they... they so most kids now come back and try to insult their parent and try to make them feel bad and then compare your parenting with some other kid and their parents and hoping that you'll give in. Let me just say, that did not work at my house growing up. But, uh, you know, parent, but kids try that. And then the child comes back a third time with the ultimate, you don't love me. <laughs> and a tear in their eye. And then, oh, next thing you know, you're out at Domino's getting a pizza. And the kid gets what they want. I've seen it happen time and time and time again. Well, the Pharisees are trying that with Jesus. But let me tell you, they're not getting anywhere. They're not getting anywhere with the Lord. And he says to them, in verse, and I'm sorry, and they say back, after they quote Jesus, if anyone keeps... My word, he shall never taste death. Verse 53, and you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead, and who do you make yourself out to be? Basically, Jesus, who do you think you are? <laughs> they still were not seeing the lights. Church, who do we think we are? Right. Who in the world do we think we are? We're talking about the Lord. When people say, well, the Holy Spirit's doing a new thing today. Oh no, the Holy Spirit can only do what Jesus Christ lived and taught. Amen. Forget this new age stuff. We need to look at the word of God. And in these last days, we're seeing false teaching and false junk going around everywhere. And people fall in hook, line, and sinker for it. You know, God's up to something new today. Who do we think we are to change the word of God in the last day? People falling for misgiving and teachings left and right. Because they don't know the truth. What does the U.S. Department of Treasury do when they are when they are uh, when they are looking for counterfeit? When they're studying counterfeit money, they don't go study every different piece of counterfeit money. They simply study the real thing. That's all we need to do: study the real thing. Don't go out and find out every every false teaching that's out there somewhere. Don't worry about that. Because some people say, "Well, Pastor, what are some of those teachings?" And some of those we know. But quite frankly, I don't think we need to chase those rabbit trails. What we need to do is trace the truth, and you'll be okay. Because as soon as you see a false truth, you're going to know. Amen. And here Jesus, he is asked by the Pharisees, who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus replies, verse 54, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. What a, what a man of humility. What a man of humility. He was about his father's business. That none should perish, but all come to everlasting life. Jesus was even about that as a 12-year-old. Where did you expect me to be, Mom and Dad? I'm about my Father's business. I'm in here with where praying where you should be. And teaching Jesus, a 12-year-old, teaching the religious leaders of that day. I'd have loved to have been there and saw that. You know, but here, you know, Jesus says, I'm not honoring myself. It is, it is my Father who honors me. Next Sunday, we're going we're gonna to have water baptism in one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Matthew chapter 3, as Jesus comes out of the Jordan River, immediately what happens? The Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and then a voice from heaven in which the Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus was looking for the honor of his Father. And Jesus was obedient. 
Here, he was not committing heresy. He was proving himself to be the Messiah. The one which was prophesied over 800 times in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Isaiah. I remember my brother and I growing up, my younger brother and I, who, by the way, uh, called me and him and his wife are now expecting their third child in January. I'm all excited about that. Going to be an uncle again. Really excited about that. But as Darren and I were growing up, the last thing that we would say on the school bus, we went to a school uh, in, in Lusby, Maryland called Appeal Elementary School. It used to be Appeal, Maryland, and it was a black school initially, whilst before schools came together, races came together. But Appeal Elementary, and the last thing that we would say as we were stepping off that bus is let's make mom and dad proud today. And what brought that honor and honoring them was hopefully the, the respect and the kind words that the teacher said about us that brought honor. When I go home, this is what I preach at my home church. This is what I always say in French Frederick, Maryland. I always say, you know, Many of you now, because there's so many different people there at the church, I'll simply say I'm nothing more. In Maryland, my dad goes by the name Otis. Up here, he goes by the name Curtis. So I'll stay down there. I'll say, I'm nothing more than Otis and Joanne, Tha and Joanne, Tha Otis and Joanne Thacker's boy. Why do I say that? Because I still want to bring honor to them. Even at 36 years old, I still want to bring honor to Jesus Christ. I still want to, I still want to, uh, and here the Lord, he wanted to bring honor to his father. He wanted to bring honor to his father. Verse number 55. I'm sorry, it is verse 54. It is my father who honors me, uh, whom you say that he is your God. And here Jesus is challenging them to really answer the question, who is their God? And Jesus knew that their God was the devil. And here Jesus was saying, hey, I want to honor God. How about you? If you really say you're sons of Abraham and you're sons of God, are you, are you honoring him? How can, you, how can we possibly honor God if we slap Jesus across the face? How can we possibly honor him if we say that his word is not necessarily absolute today? And Jesus here, basically what he is doing is he is winning the arguments. He is winning the debates. Verse 55, yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. Wow, Jesus first calls them, you know, sons of the devil. Now he's calling them liars. The truth was not in them. They could not understand the truth. They could not understand the word. Why? Because they were a liar. And I would be a liar like you if I didn't bring the truth to you. And then Jesus says there at the end of verse 55, and we're almost finished, please bear with me, but I do not know him. I'm sorry, but I do know him and keep his word. Jesus was faithful to the end. Will you be faithful to the end? Will you be faithful to the end or will you say, you know, it's just too much for me out here. I'm going to tap out to the Lord. Verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Think about this, church. Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Praise the Lord. Abraham, you know, father Abraham who had, you know, many sons. That little song we see. Abraham rejoiced to see the day of the Lord. And he saw it and was glad. Wow. Church, we're seeing the signs of the time here in 2014. Are we glad? Wow, Jesus could come back today. We should be waiting and watching. Wow, think about that. Are you ready to meet him? Amen. The next time that trumpet sounds, it might be the archangel blowing it. We best be ready. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have you seen Abraham? Here they get Jesus with his age. Wow. I'm in good company. Jesus, you're not even 50 yet, and you've seen Abraham? Wow. Oh, church, they were playing right into Jesus' hand. Do you not know that you give your faith away by the things that you say? People do that all the time when I'm mentoring them, counseling them, visiting them. They give themselves away as a person of either little faith or no faith at all. 
by the things that they say. They were playing right into Jesus' hands. Verse 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. Wow. Wow. This is, this is huge to me. Here is Jesus. He has not backed down from this debate. He has not, he has not become a coward. He has stood in there with truth. And he says to them, before Abraham was, I am. What does that mean? That means He is the creator of the world. He is the beginning and the end. He is the, the most important thing. He is the I am. Amen. I am He. I am the healer. I am the creator. I am the deliverer. I am the rock. I am the savior. I am the Messiah. I am. That's all you need to know. Hallelujah. Wow, think about that, Jerk. And here's their response, verse 59. Then they took up stones. Those jokers were so furious. They were stirring in their seat. They were so angry. They were ready to bring harm to the Lord. And they were picking up stones. And they picked up stones to do what? To throw at Him. They weren't just going to sit there and, and just juggle them. They wanted to bring harm to the Lord. The devil was so much in them that they wanted to bring harm to Jesus Christ. Wow. There have been times in which people get so stirred up from God's word even here. Rather than running to the altar to the feet of Jesus, they exit stage left. Right. And sometimes with great anger. Because the truth is finding themselves out and, and the adversary is stirring up so much inside of them. And if they choose not to repent, they have no choice but to lash out somewhere else. Mm. And then write me a big, long, nasty note. Or threaten my life. Here they're doing the same with Jesus. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself. And went out of the temple. Going through the midst of them. And so passed by. You say how did Jesus do this so quickly? How did he get away? Time and time again. Remember Jesus is God. It takes a little time to pick up stones. It takes As they took their attention off of him, he already knew they were going to do that. So as soon as Jesus said, I am, I am, I am, as soon as he said that, he had already went into his escape. Which is why by the time they picked up the stones to lash out against the Lord, he had already went into the crowds until the appointed time. He's all-knowing. You say, why didn't Jesus take the stones at that point? Because it wasn't the Father's time. Right. Jesus still had another, another year and a half worth of ministry to do. To build up to that point. And, that, and Jesus, even, when the, Jesus even says that in the Gospels. And what, it's not my appointed time, so I slid away. I hid myself until it was time. But Jesus stirred them up to a point of violence. But they still did not receive the truth. And Jesus knew that they would die in their sin. You know, which is why I preach the way I preach, church. I care about the soul of the individual. True freedom is centered around the soul. True freedom is not centered around what feels good or what things you can get by with without getting in trouble. True freedom deals with the obedience of God's word. And wanting to please him with your life. And not just when it feels good, but 24 7. Some people have the philosophy well, I can go home and let my guard down and live how I want at home. No, you can't. Jesus cares about the secret place in your home, belongs to the Lord. You're just a steward of it. You don't own that. Amen. Say, Pastor, well, I, I paid my mortgage. I own that. Well, it actually belongs to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Tim, God, see how long you have at home. You don't own anything. You are a steward of things God has given you. You don't even own your own body. We're learning that in the food pantry. Your body belongs to the Lord. It was paid for with a price. What was the price? Jesus' body on the cross. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't even own your own body. So you're not free to make these statements like the Pharisees were making. We're free to put our faith in the Lord and obey Him and let him bless us. Amen. Blessing after blessing. Amen. Keeps on following me. Amen. I want that. Amen. I want Jesus 
to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't want to see death. I want to be free to live for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Let me close with this. July 3rd was two years with no candy. I'm free. Mm -hmm. Not going to bother me anymore. I've had several people, Pastor, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. You can eat candy in front of me. I don't care. Today, those kids were putting a hurt on those Kit Kats. <laughs> Reese Cups. Didn't bother me a bit. My Mary's got a bag at home full of candy. People say, is that still there? Yep, because I haven't touched it. <laughs> Free from it. Amen. Same with soda. Amen. Free from it. I don't believe I have to worry about diabetes. Amen. Because God has brought freedom to my life. You, you know, my 34 pants now are getting loose. Praise the Lord. I'm going to get back into 32s with. I'm going to get back. I'm going to need my suit back. If I get back into 32s, man. I tell you what. God can, God can do great things if you put your faith in Him. Church, that's true freedom. And that's what I want for every person that comes here, is to live a life that's free. John 8, 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you're free indeed. Father, Thank you for your word here tonight. Hello. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services. Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m. Worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.